Heavenly Father, we thank you for this place to sing our songs to you. We thank you that no matter what brings us to this place, whether it is a need for peace, a need for forgiveness, a need to celebrate, whatever brings us to this place, your spirit meets us with open arms here in your presence this morning. And we pray this all in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and our Savior, and all of God's people said, Amen. Amen. Invite you, I welcome you to this place, this place of worship on this day. Uh, some of us are, uh, some of our church body is at another place at Inman Mennonite Church. The youth are serving their meal over there as a fundraiser. So think of them as they are there. There are those of us that are sick as well that aren't here. But we are here as a family of God to celebrate, to celebrate the mission that Jesus Christ calls us to. And throughout the service, you will see there are times and moments for you to reignite your pledge to be followers of Jesus Christ, our Redeemer and our Lord. And the first one is to stand and to sing together the song, I Will Sing of My Redeemer, verses 1, 3, and 4. be seated. You know, we've sung about this idea of sing, O oh, sing of my Redeemer, with his blood he purchased me. And you know the, the words you sang there, hopefully. And uh, I was trying to think of how do I convey, or how do we bring to light within ourselves those words? Like, what is that meaning? And I thought, you know, we're going to have a bunch of of catechisms, catechumens, remember that big word? Catechumens preparing themselves for baptism. And many of us here have said yes to the vows of baptism, 
to following Jesus Christ, the Redeemer of whom we just sang of. So I thought, wow, wouldn't it be interesting if I proposed to you those vows again so that maybe if you don't remember what you said yes to, or maybe you need that push this week, or maybe if you're practicing wanting to follow Jesus Christ, I mean not wanting to follow Jesus Christ, but practicing for your baptism, maybe we could do that this morning. I will read those vows to you. Do not answer them if you don't mean it. But please do, if that is from the heart of hearts, your answer. Answer as you would, as you did maybe years ago or a year ago, or that you are planning to answer. I will ask the, the questions in yellow, and you in the bold will answer accordingly. Do you renounce the evil powers of this world and turn to Jesus Christ as your Savior? Do you put your trust in His grace and love and promise to obey Him as your Lord? Do you believe in God, the Father Almighty, the Maker of heaven and earth, in Jesus Christ, God's Son, our Lord, and in the Holy Spirit, the Giver of life? Do you accept the Word of God as guide and authority for your life? Are you willing to give and to receive counsel in the congregation? Are you ready to participate in the mission of the church? Amen. We're going to stay seated. Hannah's going to lead us in singing an a cappella song, a prayerful song, another song of dedicating yourself, of making real those I do's and those I am's. I bind my heart this tide. Together, let's pray the prayer that Christ taught us to pray. Our Father, who is in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom, the power, and the glory. Amen. <clears throat>
I'm going to invite all the kids forward. And uh, you met Dan the Can last week. Dan the Can is back, or at least Don the Can. And uh, would all the kids come forward? We've got some work to do this morning. Oh boy, I can see it happening. In just a minute, we'll get all situated here. Okay, so who remembers what we talked about last week? Dan the Can. And what's going to happen with Dan the Can? Is he going to be collected up here in our Super Bowl bowl? Yes. Because it's Super Bowl Sunday. And here at this church, we're collecting cans, but you know the Super Bowl is from the whole country where the best football teams, they get to be playing tonight. But just like the Super Bowl, all over the country, people are bringing cans to their own little Super Bowl so that people can have food where they might not have enough. And so um, we want to just think of what happens to these cans once we bring them. We're going to go, and we're going to actually do something special here in a little bit because we have these carts. And I'm going to have two volunteers run the cart, and then everybody else gets to be a little superstar and go collect soup for the food bank, okay? So are you ready to do that? Who wants to run this right there? You do? Okay. And did you want to run one? Did you get one here? So we've got two people, and everybody gets to help them. We're, you're going to get to be superstars because there may still be... You can help. You get to help because you get to go with either one of those, and, and you can too. You can go find soup. And then when you come back, we'll, put the, we'll, we'll find if there's any more soup cans out there, and we'll put them in here, and we'll see how this works. Let's go ahead and take, take those out, and let's see if we can find it. Let's look out there and see if there's any soup left. Just put it in the basket when you get a chance. You, do you have, or you think you're gonna go? Let's go find some. You can bring it here whenever you're ready too, if you have some. There you go. So we're thinking about where these cans are coming from. They're coming from the store. They're going into the shopping carts, and so then it goes to the food bank. And we have a food bank in Hutchinson. And so whenever the people are gonna need more food, these cans are going to help. So that's what you're doing with your shopping carts, bringing these cans. Let's go ahead and bring all the, all the carts back up, and all the children, because super star children also get to have a couple of starbursts when we're all done. But let's put these cans right up in here, if they fit. If not, they're okay right there. Come on back. Let's gather here and we'll have a little prayer for Dan the Can. All right, right there. They all go right up here. Everybody doing good? Okay, there we are. Got more cans? You're doing fine. Everybody's a superstar. I think everybody's gonna get a treat. Okay, and now let's, let's put our hands together and let's pray. Dear God, thank you for these cans, for Dan the Can, for the soup kitchen, for not the soup kitchen, but the food warehouse, and for the people that will benefit and be blessed by this food. And we ask you to bless us through this week. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, here we go, guys. There's one more thing. Because you're superstars, each one gets a starburst. You get two actually, so one for you and one to share with somebody that doesn't have one, okay? Everybody understand how it works? Okay, here we go. Just take two. You can take them right there. And there's more. Okay? We got candy. 
Here you are. Thanks everyone for participating. Thank you. Don, your phone's up here in case you need to answer a call. <laughs> Cliff notes, he said. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for that, and thank you for the mission. And again, a reminder that we are in the month of meals, that uh, the youth groups are serving their, me their meals. We are raising food for the Super Bowl. Nick, this coming Wednesday is the Noodle Soup Supper, which raises 100% of the money raised, goes to the outreach meals that we'll be putting together, 30,000 meals that we'll be putting together on the 25th. And the sign-up sheet for that is in your bulletins or out in the hall as well. So remember that as we think of February, our month of meals. And I wonder maybe if the scripture that, uh, that our brand new deacon Eric Buller will read to us might give us a clue about why we do all of this. If you have your Bibles or smartphones or iPads, <laughs> or you can look up on the screen, we'll be reading from Matthew 28 verses 16 through 20. Then the eleven disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain where Jesus had told them to go. When they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. Then Jesus came to them and said, All authority in heaven and on earth hath been given to me. Therefore go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. May God bless the reading and for those who hear the word of God. Amen.
Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word on our lives. We pray now that the words of my mouth and the meditations of, my, of our hearts be acceptable to you, and that our eyes and our ears and our souls and our hearts and our bodies be opened to deeper service. Open my mouth to speak. Amen. If you looked at that video, I truly believe you could sum it up by saying that the cross, and we have a sample of the cross we see every day, a cross that can become so trivialized in trinketry, the cross compels us to serve. And the cross is really the cross point the cross point of a choice in our lives. And you saw it sort of uh, put between the cross and the crowd, a choice we make, not just on a Sunday morning when we sing all these fun little songs, but when you step out of your door on Monday morning, all the way till you come back to Bueller Mennonite Church on a Sunday. The cross point of our lives. Now when Elias was a little boy, he was just learning how to walk, he and Hannah and I took a trip to uh, the Ukraine. My sister was serving with MCC in a, in a city called Zaporozhye in Ukraine. She'd served, she ended up serving there for three years. And as we were getting to know the landscape, and as I was invited to preach in a local uh, evangelical Baptist church with whom the, uh, the MCC was, was partnering in that area, they were their main partner, and Elizabeth had been worshiping with them, she made an interesting insight about these partners and the way they viewed the world around them as a, as a church, as a body of Christ. She shared with us that the Evangelical Baptist Church, that amongst them, evangelism, that word evangelism, and the action of evangelism is probably the single most common theme in their worship and in their fellowship and in their service. That is the root of it all. Indeed, it defines them as a church. It's the cross point for them as a church. Now, much of this probably had to do with their relatively new freedom. We visited them right, uh, I think, uh, 2002, something like 2002, 2003. And it hadn't been that long since they had become an independent country, apart from the, uh, the United Social, uh, Socialist uh, Soviet Republics, the and had entered a new era of uh, free market society. And, uh, and under communism, uh, communist rule, to evangelize, to proselytize, was forbidden, very much forbidden. And we've talked about the history of that within the, the USSR. But it was not only for that reason. The centrality of evangelism within that church, within knowing who they were, was indeed the reason to exist, the mission. Or you could say God's mission in Ukraine, and they were joining it, if you remember what we talked about several Sundays ago. You see, the Baptist church in Ukraine, much like the Mennonites have historically done, defines itself very sharply, in sharp contrast, and even in opposition to what is often referred to in, in Paul's writings, you see it quite a bit, the world. And I know we, we, we struggle with this within our own Mennonite circle. What does the world mean as opposed to this? And some of us feel like we've been liberated from that sort of language and that sort of understanding. And, but there's some sort of wisdom to this, and especially the case that Paul keeps on talking about the cross point between the world and the body of Christ, the church, God's mission in this world. And in Ukraine, the world is where for them alcoholism, domestic abuse, depression, violence, and corruption run rampant. So much to the point where if you didn't see, if you saw someone that refused to drink or to smoke, you knew they were a Christian. It was that clearly defined. And I'm not saying that's what we're necessarily the lines that we draw, but for them it was that clearly defined. That was the crowd. So the Ukrainian believers, when they say the I do's like we did this morning and joined the church, 
are called to make a clear and sharp break from the world as they become the body of Christ. And they are very visibly a beacon, salt, light, a city on the hill, as they would talk about it. The church is defined over and against the world. And that church becomes their new community with its own assumptions, its own morals, its own ethics. And it's clear to them that they respond to Elijah's call that we studied in, in, in Wednesday night about a year ago. Elijah's call or his question of how long will you go hobbling around on two different allegiances, it's very clear to them which allegiance they have. They cannot have one foot on one side and one foot on the other side. They are either in or they are out. And it's very interesting to see how they operate. And Elizabeth would tell you that the Ukrainian Baptists do not take their faith for granted because they never could before. It's not something they do as a hobby. It's not something they do on the side. It's not something they go and consume when they're feeling life is pressing in on them. It is who they are. And it becomes quite evident then as they partner with MCC. Now, in sharing with you a little bit about, about the Ukrainian church, I used a word that no doubt either got some of your pulses really going, I can't believe he said that word. Yes, yes, yes. And some of you said, oh, Lord. He said that word in church. Evangelism, right? And I even have a hard time sometimes talking about or even saying that word publicly because there have been some terribly bad examples of what has been called evangelism in our church or in the church. <laughs> and it's rooted in imperialism. We know that. But there are also good examples of what it means. Evangelism. All sorts of meanings probably flood into you as you hear it. Hopefully it does to some of you. I mean, if some of you are going, I have never heard that word before. Well, you have this morning. So listen up. All of us listen up, actually. But what does that word really mean? Like, what does it mean for the church? And especially, what will it mean for us as Bueller Mennonite Church? What does it have to do with the mission or our existence of Bueller Mennonite Church? And at this point in the sermon, I want to wow you again with my Greek. Okay? So just, so I've already used a word that maybe floored some of you. Now I'm going to use some Greek. The Greek word for evangelism in your Bibles, there it is. You can see it. Now you are Greek scholars. is eangelion. Eangelion. Sounds a lot like evangelism. That's where we get evangel from. But okay, right, so... We've got a Greek word. We know that that's in the Bible. What, uh, what in the world does that mean for us? Well, eugelion is the word that's most often translated in your English translations in two ways. The first way is, the first way is, wow, technology, I got it. <laughs> the first way is the gospel. And you, you, you hear about gospel-believing churches, or they preach the gospel. It's, or the gospel of Matthew, or the gospel of whatever. It's, it's, uh, it's based on that word, eongelion. But most of your Bibles will also interchange it with this definition, the good news. So when you read the good news Bible, the good news translation, it's the gospel news. It's the evangelical news, the, and not in terms of evangelical, all the, the baggage of what it means in the U.S., but what it means is a root language. It means the gospel, the good news. So there's some sort of news that needs to be shared. And this isn't alternative news here, folks. This is the good news. Because Paul is very clear that it is our job to be people of this good news. To live it, to claim it, and then to pass it on. The good news. So you, it's the gospel and the good news. Evangelion. And it means the process... It's actually not necessarily just a noun, it's a verb. This is where it also should get really uncomfortable for us. It's not just something we can sit around and talk about over coffee. It's something that we are called to do. It's an imperative. It means bringing, it means preaching, it means sharing, it means teaching, it means communicating the evangelion. It means communicating the good news. In fact, in really bad English grammar, 
but in a way that gets across the full meaning that if we are holding true to evangelizing, we are in fact good newsizing. So if you are called to be evangelists, or the church is called to be evangelical, you are called to be good newsers. Good newsers. You don't see the church of the good newser too often. But that's the point. I mean, I think it drives the point of this, this, this sort of abstract word a little bit closer. We are called to be people of the good news. But not just be something in terms of that's what we call ourselves, but it defines our action. We are good newsizing in Bueller. We are good newsizing in the world. We are good newsizing amongst each other. The fact that we gather, we are good newsing right now. Okay, now that you kind of know what evangelism means, or at least the Greek root of it in your Bibles, what does it have to do more so with Bueller Mennonite Church? Well, let's take a closer look at that passage that, that Eric read to us this morning. If you have your Bibles open, Matthew 28. This passage we often talk about as the Great Commission. The Great Commission. And lo and behold, where do we hear that language? The Great Commission. Other than the Bible. Where else do we know very readily from what we know as, as good newsers or as Bueller Mennonite Church? What do we know about that term? Where else do we find it? People. Where is it found? Very clearly says, rooted in the Great Commission and the Great Commandment. Where have you heard it before? Mission statement, yes! It's who we are. At least we say we are. Let's read that mission statement together if you can read it. It's also on the tops of your bulletins. I'm going to use that one. That print is a little fine. Let's read it together out loud so that nobody here can say they've never heard of this before. Together. In line with the great commandment and the great commission, the mission of Bueller Mennonite Church can easily be remembered by the word great. We exist to glorify God through praise and worship, relate as a family of God, educate through the word, alleviate pain and suffering in the world around us, and to testify to the love and salvation of Jesus Christ. That's how we've defined what it means to be good newsers for us. That is called the Great, uh, that's our statement, and it's rooted in the Great Commission. So it looks like the Great Commission is a pretty essential part, at least in the lip service we give for being a church. Now, the word commission, we used to have the commission on the overseas missions, and we had all sorts of commissions on, you know, what, they had the commission to figure out who shot John F. Kennedy, and what does commission mean? What does commission mean? Often artists get commissioned to do a piece of art. Well, another word for commission, very closely related, is assignment. The great assignment. The great assignment, or maybe the mission. But let's stick with assignment. Jesus in Matthew 28 gives believers the great assignment of being good newsers, of spreading the good news. We have some sort of news. We need to use our outlets to spread that news. Now how does Jesus say in the great assignment, how does Jesus say we are to spread the news? And he gives us some clues. Let's take a, the wor let's take a look at the words he uses and notice again how action oriented they are. Look there in the text. I'm going to leave the text up there. I'm going to focus on three, well, the first action text I don't even have up there, but he says, therefore, that means so. And I don't know if you noticed, Eric, I added, I added the verse uh, right before, I added verse 16 and 17 in Eric's reading. Did you notice that the people all gathered? Did you hear what, what, what Eric read there? It said, many believed, but some doubted. I think that's interesting text, especially in the face that Jesus is standing before them. Many believed, but some still doubted. And I am guess there are some of you that are still going, that mission statement, seriously, is that what we decided we were? Oh, no. 
Well, maybe we are doubters, but our job is to together to walk this journey. How so? And then he says, therefore, he says, go. And that's printed on the front of your, uh, your, your uh, bulletins. Again, that's not a tepid like, oh, you know, guys, you know, if the committee decides this is something we want to do, let's maybe think about doing it and we'll write a paper on it and then vote on it and then you know, maybe do a review after two years. He says, go. Go do what? He says, go make, baptize, and teach. See those words in there? None of those let us off the hook to just simply show up on Sunday morning. It makes us more than a Sunday morning church. Go, make, baptize, and teach. Very clearly, those action words, that's how Jesus is saying we are called to be good newsers in this great assignment that he gives. Which, by the way, in Matthew is the very last thing Jesus does. It's the very last word of Jesus. So I think those words define, then, our mission statement. If we're plugging ourselves into the Great Commission, the Great Assignment in our mission statement, then all of a sudden, make, baptize, and teach become our modus operandi. Very clearly. Let's dig a little deeper. What might baptize, make, baptize, and teach look like for us? Let's wrestle with this a little bit, because in the end, you have a chance to say, Wilmer, you're way off. Or, Wilmer, I'm not, I didn't sign up for that. Or maybe Jesus was way off on this. You can say that if you want to. But let's at least come to some sort of accord. Jesus, one thing we know is Jesus commanded this. Jesus said it to us, and he meant it for us. So then we need to decide what that means. All right. First, Jesus says in Matthew 28, he says, Go make disciples of all nations. We are called to make disciples, to make disciples. What does this mean? And again, there's been so many different ways this has been done. Um, but I'm trying to think about what it might mean for us as Bueller Mennonite Church to make disciples. And I'm guessing that the way Jesus made disciples is a pretty good clue about how might we make disciples. And it didn't involve a class that only met four times a month or only met for four times in one month, and then you had it all figured out. These people walked for three years with Jesus, and even in the end, they didn't get it. The disciples didn't get it, but they were still considered disciples as part of this journey. Did he quickly run into Nazareth and toss some tracks out into the street and say, say some new and flashy pre-rehearsed religious words and say, okay, either you're with me or you're not, and then he left. And he tallied out how many people said yes and how many people didn't respond, how many people said no. Was that the way he made disciples? Not the Bible I read. He met them where they were at. He walked with people. He prayed with people. With them, in tow, on them. He touched them. He healed them. He taught them. He served the people. He washed his own disciples' feet, and they didn't get it. He even died. He gave the ultimate sacrifice in service to his disciples. And he admonished them. And then he invited them to join the work. And I believe that's our job. And it's going to take different ways of doing it. Don't get pigeonholed because someone has bought into and has tried to define what the word evangelical means. Evangelical is very clearly stated in your Bibles. Not necessarily as point one, point two, point three, but as example. As walking with people, as praying with people, as, as healing with people, as teaching them, as serving them, as admonishing them, as inviting them, as sacrificing your own lives for them. That is how disciples are made. And more often than not, you will not convince another person by reason and by argument to become a Christian, but you will convince them to be a disciple by how you follow Jesus Christ as disciple and the relationship you have with Christ and how that emanates out and then the relationship and the respect you offer to the person with whom you are discipling. That is the discipling component. 
we are invited to do much more than just say a few pious words and then judge to see if people answered or didn't answer. We are called to be like Jesus was with his disciples. And folks, that is hard work. It is long-term work, and it's not work that will just be a matter of a few sessions, and voila, we've got the disciples Jesus wants. So making disciples then leads to a second step of action in Jesus' ministry. So we are discipling, then we are called to baptize. And the act of baptism, as you've heard me say before, is an action of commitment. Or often you've heard me say that it is an, in, it is an outward sign of an inward reality. Discipling is also very much the inward reality. Now the question is, will you now commit yourself very outwardly to what has happened on your inside, to your soul? Baptism is an act of commitment that publicly shows that you are now a disciple, you are marked, you are on the rolls, this is the team you are playing for. To this kingdom, you are pledging your full allegiance. Even if it means your life. And much like a wedding, baptism is a vow, a public ceremony where a believer shares his or her vows to now follow Jesus Christ as the captain of the team, as the Lord, as the representative of the kingdom of God. We are called by Jesus to invite people to make this commitment, this pledge of allegiance to this call. Being the disciple is a good step, but there needs to be the next step of commitment. We, are also, we also see baptism as a way of holding each other accountable. Did you read that in the baptismal vows that you recited this morning? One of the questions is, will you give and will you receive counsel in the church? You are tying yourself to a body of believers. So when you become a disciple and you make this vow, you, don't, you aren't a free agent. You are playing on a team. You need the team to help you figure out how to continue to be faithful to Jesus. So how will you hold each other accountable? How will you invite people to this commitment and to Christ and make baptism a sign of such a commitment? And again, I would vouch that your holding to your commitment is probably the number one example for others to see whether it's worth it or not. Remember how I described the church in Ukraine? Very vivid distinction of the cross point between cross and crowd. Well, in America, we have much fuzzier lines distinguishing church fellowship from society at large. And the question is, why is that? When I was in Ukraine, we, had, I, we got invited out to... Uh, to, to deacons of one of, the, of, of one of the, Bapti the Baptist churches there. And the first question they asked me is, what do you excommunicate over? I had to think, mass murder? You know, we don't draw those sort of lines. And then he said, well, how do you keep your members in check? I said, well, our members, they can just go and come as they please. If they don't like it at this church, there's a Kmart at the corner. If you don't like Walmart, you go. If you don't like Burger King, you go to McDonald's. You just make a choice of where you go. It's a dime a dozen. He said, well, we would never send a letter of recommendation to those churches. And I said, we don't have that sort of accountability in, in America. You, it's, more of a, it's a more of a magnet sort of deal. We're not building walls to keep people in and out. We're trying to attract people to the love of Christ in the middle, and there's pros and cons to that. But the point is, in America, we have a much fuzzier sense of the demarcation or the cross point of Christ and the crowd. And might it be that a good part of it is, and this is where maybe the, the, it drives at who we are, might a good part of it be that there is no real commitment required upon joining a church. That it's much harder to discern who is really engaged with the community and the kingdom of God than from those that are just sort of going along with the ride, for the ride. We have, it seems, made it very easy to follow both the cross and the crowd, and in some cases we have let our fears 
and our need for security to allow the crowd to define the meaning of the cross. And these tides can easily sweep through our churches at the whim of the blowing winds. Or maybe in some cases we have defined God's salvation to only meaning something in the future, a life insurance policy after I die. And we forget that the moment we are saved, it changes our very lifestyle from the get-go. It allows us to act saved, or the way we talk about church allows us to act unsaved in our everyday dealings of the church or of our life. Well, I happen to believe that there's a pretty big difference between belonging or not belonging to the way of Jesus Christ and the community of God. And if we are truly disciples of Christ, then our baptism becomes a sign that we believe that Jesus not only makes a difference in our eternal state and some here life hereafter, but our eternal life begins the day that we say, Lord, I am a sinner, save me, and I follow Jesus as my Lord. And I say yes to those questions that were asked and answered this morning. Christianity then isn't just a belief, something that I cognitively can answer uh, give uh, answers to in my head, but it becomes a way of life. It is who we are. And baptism is the sign that we have committed ourselves. And we're going to fail. We are going to fail, because I do at least. Maybe you don't, but I do. We are going to fail, but it, it becomes a commitment to demarcate the difference between the crowd and the cross. And the gospel then, the good news is that Jesus starts making a difference the moment we say and answer yes to Jesus when he says, pick up your cross and follow me. Where he says, come, I will make you fisher of people. Follow my footsteps. So we at Bueller Mennonite Church need to be determined to call people to a commitment of allegiance to the way of Jesus Christ and to God's kingdom. We are called to show how the cross is different than the crowd and why it is most advantageous to choose the cross over the crowd. We are called to baptize people into committed relationships with Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior of the world. And that directly leads then to our third assignment, which is we are called to teach action. In verse 20, Jesus calls, tells us that we are to teach people to obey, this is the quote, obey everything I have commanded you. And notice Jesus doesn't say, not what Leviticus commands you, not what Deuteronomy commands you, but what I have commanded you. And Paul often, and other writers in the New Testament, say that that's not only just the spoken words of Jesus, but those are the actions of Jesus. So Jesus' commands aren't just the do this and do that that he spoke, but it's his very way of living that we are called to uh, teach people to obey and ourselves to obey. And if we start taking this commandment of Jesus seriously, then the distinction, I believe, of the cross and the crowd becomes even more distinct. If we really take serious what Jesus says in this verse, then the church begins to separate from the voices of the world. And, uh, and if there's ever been a time to, to be distinct about Jesus' teaching, because everybody says, Jesus, Jesus, now is the time to really know what Jesus commands us and teaches us, because Jesus says, follow that. In behavior, not just in word or in mission statements, but how you live out your life. The church starts becoming distinct from the way of hopelessness, from the ways of violence, from the ways of hatred. It becomes distinct from the ways of isolation and the ways of fear. How can it not? Not if you take Jesus seriously. What are those commandments of Jesus? And I'm going to remind you of just a few today. There are many more. 
But these encapsulate the categories of Jesus' commands. So just in case someone asks you afterwards and says, well, okay, it's good to teach Jesus' commandments. What are they? You've got a few here. You've got the references in your, in your bulletins. What are the commandments of Jesus that we might live them and we might teach them? Jesus commands, you have heard it said, an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth, but I say do not resist an evil person. If someone hits you on the right cheek, turn them also the other. If someone forces you to go one mile, go with them too. I didn't make this up. The Mennonite church didn't make this up. Jesus did. So you've got to believe whether or not you trust Jesus. I tell you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you so that you will be sons of your father, sons and daughters, of your father in heaven. Jesus commands, do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth but store up treasures in heaven. Jesus commands, do not judge, or you too will be judged. Jesus commands, if anyone wants to follow me, they must deny themselves. That's of pride, of hubris, of power, of prestige. If anyone wants to follow me, they must deny themselves and pick up their cross. And I want to make a point here. Often we say that's our cross to bear crosses our decisions to bear. They're not foisted on us by God. We have a decision. Will I pick up that cross and follow Jesus or not? Crosses are decisions we make in life. And Jesus says, if anyone wants to follow me, be my disciple, they must deny themselves and pick up their cross and follow me. Jesus said that. If anyone wants to be first, they must be last. And a servant to everyone. Jesus said that. Jesus commands a new commandment I give unto you. Love one another. As I have loved you, so you should love one another. And by this, and that's an action, folks. Remember how I've been saying that more likely than not, the gospel, the most of the gospel, the greatest gospel people will hear and accept is what you live out. This is what Jesus is saying here. Why do we love one another? Because by this all people will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. They're looking to you to see if it really makes a hill of beans different to become a follower of Jesus Christ, to become a Christian. These are just some, just a few of the commandments that we are called to teach. And the amazing thing about these commandments are that they are not just things to know. In fact, the only way you can really know them is if you live them. And if this is true, can you see how the cross and the crowd become differences, become distinct, apart from each other? Can you begin to see how the church is so much different than the world. We are called to live, to teach these commandments to the whole world. And Bueller Mennonite Church, if we stay true to our calling, our calling by Jesus in the Great Commission, the great assignment of being faithful evangelists, I propose to you that our evangelism will match that envisioned by Menno Simons. That true evangelical faith cannot lie sleeping. It doesn't lie dormant like a seed, but it clothes the naked, it feeds the hungry, it comforts the sorrowful, it shelters the destitute, it serves that whom harm it, it binds up that which is wounded, and it has become all things to all people. So, who will follow the way of the cross? Let it be, let it continue to be our mission to faithfully serve in God's kingdom by fulfilling Jesus' great commission, his great assignment to make disciples who are committing themselves through baptism to follow the commandments of Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen.
as you remain seated and the gifts of God are brought forth into the presence of God for dedication to his work, let's raise our voices in singing Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Let's end our time with, with uh, giving testimony to how God is at work, where God's good news is at flowing through, where we might be joining as good newsers. Uh, here's good testimony of good newsing right here. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> what a surprise. Wow. <laughs> At least it wasn't yellow. <laughs> I feel like a champion. <laughs> Stand, and as a closing blessing, let's sing through the song that we all know. The Lord lift you up, the Lord take your hand, the Lord lead you forth and cause you to stand. Secure in God's word, seeking God's face, abiding in love, abounding in grace. everything you need to be and to go and be good newsers. Go in peace. Thank you.